Our next speaker is James Kidder. Uh, James uh, is currently doing a PhD at Queen's University. He started at Laurentian, now he's at Queen's in hydrogeochemistry. Hydrogeochemistry being one of these things that's having, that's uh, been advancing a lot in the last 10 years. Um, before that, James uh, worked in the uh, African Copper Belt, and specifically a few years in Botswana. He spent some time as a mining analyst in London before that and started off his career uh, doing gold exploration for Rand Gold in Africa. So, James, please. Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk to you this morning about exploration under total cover using a case study from Northwest Botswana. Um, so, what is the problem and why do we care? Well, post mineral cover is dominant in many of the world's world class, uh, world -class exploration districts, including porphyry copper in the Atacama Desert, as you saw in the last talk non-ferrous mineral deposits across Australia, as well as sed sedimentary host of copper deposits in the Kalahari and Namib deserts. Total cover is um, sort of like one of the more extreme cover scenarios that we have to deal with, where you have zero outcrop at surface, and generally these are quite data poor areas, and we need to generate tools which we can use to explore in these environments. So why Northwest Botswana? Well, Hitzman et al. 2012 postulated an extension of the uh, Katangan main basin around into north Bos uh, northwest Botswana. And the Katangan supergroup hosts one of the world's biggest accumulations of copper in the Central African Copper Belt. About this same time, Hitzman also uh, noted from some core that was available some similar textures and styles of mineralization to what you might associate with the Copper Belt. And the opportunity to explore largely untested ground, uh, which was composed of Katangan strat, which has been obscured by Kalahari sands, uh, was an opportunity to test an area that could potentially obscure a giant copper deposit. So what were the units that, that we intersected or we encountered? Well, the basement is granitic, it's aged about 2.5 GA. The only outcrop that is available in the area is outside of the project area. And it's, so the only regional outcrop is the Cedillo Hills, which is a suite of quartzites with basal conglomerates, aged about 1.9 GA. The Katangan supergroup itself, and within this suite, we're look, the, the host rocks we're looking for are carbonaceous shales, which have, uh, can promote a reducing at reaction and concentrate copper, preferably the lowest reducing horizon. Uh, there are discrete occurrences of the Karoo occurring in paleo channels, and the entire sequence is covered by a thick but uh, relatively consistent veneer of the Kalahari supergroup. So if, we look on, if you look on the right there, uh, this is a sort of cartoonish section of the Kalahari supergroup. The bottom unit, the purpley pink unit, is the Katangan, uh, the Katangan bedrock. Um, the first common uh, feature you'll see is a basal conglomerate, which is a uh, brecciated bedrock, which has been mobilized along that interface horizon, where you have a, a significant gradient. And it uh, looks like this. And it's been uh, cemented in place by calcretes and silcretes, which overlie it, which is this blue unit. They're sometimes biotubated. Uh, but the whole sequence itself is covered by these Kalahari sands, um, the main features of which are these paleo redox horizons, which represent the redox front uh, of the original water table where we've had precipitation of iron oxides onto sand grains. They're generally dominated by hematite and gertite, and typically you'll encounter several of these units as you've had, or, or these occurrences or these layers as you've had, fluctuating water table or regressing water table over time. There's a pretty poor soil development in the area. Uh, and the, the surface is very active. There's a lot of aeolian uh, windblown material. So what does total cover look like? This is a, an aerial photograph from the project area. And it's just to demonstrate that you are dealing in an area where there is zero outcrop. There's no indication of all of what might be beneath the cover. Um, these, th these are all Kalahari sands. There's sporadic vegetation. And there's some development of dunes, which trend east-west. This is a, a bit of a a rough cartoonish model which sort of demonstrates what we did and why we did it. One of the first things to say is that there was a lot of people involved in this project over quite a long time. But one of the first things that took place was uh, use of uh, some trial soil samples over known mineralized occurrences. These, these weren't particularly successful and it was hard to um, say definitively that we were picking up a signal through the cover. So we, we moved on pretty quickly and did a regional uh, EM survey using spectrum over the entire tenement package, which we followed up later with a second geophysical airborne survey using gyrolag to do a gravity survey. 
We used EM to sort of hone in onto a corridor of perspective stratigraphy, which we then pattern drilled and on a two by two K grid. And we drilled about 220 holes. Essentially, these were soil samples because we were drilling through the cover and, uh, and into the bedrock. We tried a couple of different drilling techniques. We first started with RC and we moved on to Sonic. The problem you have with drilling in the Kalahari is there's a lot of moisture variation within sand as well as hardness contrast between the, uh, the, the pretty much unconsolidated Kalahari sands and the uh, pretty well cemented silcretes and calcretes. So we failed with both those drilling techniques to get an adequate or quality sample. So we ended up diamond drilling this, uh, the, the, these holes. And our model, our geochemical model for the horizons which we were particularly looking to accumulate anomalies in, firstly were the paleo redox horizons where um, our pathfinder elements which are hydromorphically mobilized through the water table precipitate onto the coatings of iron oxides within these, uh, at the redox front of the water table. Secondly, uh, lower down, uh, lateral dispersion of pathfinder elements through the water table into the sands, producing much larger halos. Uh, thirdly, at the bedrock interface, we were looking for um, evidence of um, indicator minerals or brecciated mineralization, which had been mobilized uh, gravimetrically along that interface horizon, potentially producing large halos. One example of this is the Eloise deposit in Australia. Uh, we also drilled a, a six meter tail into the bedrock uh, and we did a four acid digest on that looking to use it for lithogeochemistry, um, evidence of base infertility as well as vectors of alteration and mineralization. About this time we also drilled a strat line perpendicular to our um, corridor of interest to start to, to start to build a geological model for the area and we also tested some early conceptual holes uh, based on knowledge from the copper belt as well as uh, some early geophysical anomalies we had. And late in the project, we also trialed hydrogeochemistry here as a pilot. So area reduction using, M, uh, using EM, we started with a, a land tenement package of about 12,000 square kilometers. We, drill, uh, we flew lines east-west at about one kilometer spacing initially. Over areas that were of interest from regional mag, we flew, we infilled at 500 meter spacing and as the survey progressed, areas that were interesting within the EM, we followed up with 200 meter spacing. And this was one of the most powerful tools we had to quickly drop area, areas and move into a, a zone of, of interest. If you look at the top right there, that's a, a map of depth of cover. So anywhere in brown is more than 100 meter thick uh, cover sequence. So we immediately dropped those areas because it's hard for us to prospect through, uh, to explore through them. So that area, those areas were dropped. Uh, if you look at the middle image, to the west, there's a, a lack of perspective or conductive strat, which we are looking for, so we dropped those areas as well. And we were quickly left with this corridor of Harlequin, uh, um, of our, basically our uh, conductive shale packages, which uh, were flanking along a basement high. So the image on the left there is of the pattern drill corridor, and this is an isopack of the Kalahari sequence, and you can see it's relatively consistent in its thickness, and this is likely uh, a product of a reasonably fat, uh, flat paleo, uh, paleo topography. Uh, this is uh, a map of the, uh, the, the gravity survey. This was particularly useful in, in helping us to develop our, our geological model. Um, in the Zambian copper belt, especially around the domes region, the basement is less dense than the overlying Katangan uh, sediments, which seems counterintuitive. But we see a similar thing here. And we were able to develop this horse model with a series of half gardens, and it quickly allowed us to um, sort of figure out the sort of terminations and unusual features we were seeing in the geology and in the, uh, in the geophysics. So I've sort of put a timeline here of what we did and when, along with the copper price, and how maybe some of the timings of things that, that we'd undertaken could have, been, could have been done slightly better. We entered the project in February 2013, and we exited in 2015, December, and it took us just under two years to go from boots on the ground to final target drill testing. Um, in terms of the geochemical grid drilling, things that we didn't trial which might have been of use here would be air core and RAB. Um, hydrogeochemistry, uh, it was a pilot at the time, but certainly the kind of information you, you can get from that and the learnings would have, been a lot, would have been provided a lot of really useful information early on. 
Uh, towards the end of the project, we also did an undercover study with CSIRO out of Australia, uh, looking at potential indicator minerals along the interface horizons, um, potential mechanisms for mobility or dispersion up through the cover, as well as different extractions. The learnings from that, again, would have been very useful early on. And I guess the, perhaps the main thing to say here is when we entered this project, the copper price was nearly $4, and when we exited it, it was nearly $2. So having a, a very supportive senior management team that's going to let you see these projects out is really important, particularly on these really high-risk projects. So in hindsight, this is a flow chart of how potentially um, conceptually exploration undercover could, be, could take place in an environment such as the Kalahari. And you'll, the first thing to note is it's, it's not a three-year project, it's a 12-month it's a project. And it involves a series of decision points, critical assessment of your project as you go through. Um, at the earliest stage, are you able to vector to host a trigraphy? And is the cover more than 100 meters? Then potentially, if the answer to both of those is yes or, or no, then you, it, the project might be unexplorable and there might be lower hanging fruit that is a better project. Likewise, as you go through, there's, going to be, there's always going to be a reason to keep going in a project like this where there are quite a few unknowns. So having these critical decisions, which can be quite brutal, is going to make you reassess the project and decide whether it's really worth to keep going. But perhaps the most important thing in this diagram is in the, is in the top left, and it's the commencement of regional hydrogeochemistry early on in the project. Because uh, particularly in the Kalahari, the population density in these rural areas is a lot higher than you might think. And these people rely on uh, government boreholes that have been drilled, private boreholes, uh, community wells. There's a, there's a lot of water sources that you might not think exist there, which will allow you to sample the groundwater without ever having to drill it. So you can build pretty quickly and pretty cheaply uh, a large regional data set, particularly in the Kalahari. Secondly, the kind of information you're going to get from uh, the field data you, you collect during the water sampling is going to be important to how you develop your model going forward. The depth of water table in the hydraulic head will give you indications of um, how dispersion might take place and in what direction. Uh, the physiochemical uh, chemistry of the groundwater will tell you the type of elemental plumes that you might encounter and how anomalies might be composed. And if the groundwater is near surface, you probably have a mechanism to uh, mobilize elements to surface, and you might be able to sample from surface without ever having to drill a borehole. So this is a 3D problem, and we need to think beyond the cover itself. As I said, if the water table is near surface, potentially the, cover, the thickness of cover is irrelevant. Uh, we didn't rely on one, target, on, on one uh, tool to target. It was a combination of geophysics and geochemistry. And hydrogeochemistry offers a solution to the total cover scenario where adequate sample sources exist. And finally, we must be willing to embrace innovation and work through problems. So I've got a couple of slides here just on hydrogeochemistry. So in Botswana, we, the pilot program we undertook there, we initially focused on our, uh, our pattern drill grid. And the first problem we encountered was we'd used diamond drilling to drill these holes. So we introduced a potential contaminant in the drilling mud. So the first problem we had to encounter was how we were going to develop these boreholes so we could sample them. And we did this via developing a, a pumping truck, which uh, were, we, we were basically able to pump water from about 100 meters below surface. So each of these holes, we pumped 5,000 liters out of them. We allowed them to uh, recharge over several months before sampling them. The second thing here is, you can see in the top middle layer, that's a, an example of a local well that was available pretty close to the grid, which we could have sampled without ever drilling anything. So this is a Frickling diagram. I've modified it from Labor on et al. 2007. And it shows you the sort of elemental composition uh, concentrations for a suite of cations for a whole different range of deposits from hydrogeochemical programs, including epithermal, IOCG, SEDEX, porphyry, and sedimentary, sedimentary hosted copper. So there's a whole suite of case studies which we can draw on for this. Perhaps the main thing to take from this diagram is the, uh, element, the pH control on cation dispersion and concentration in groundwaters, as well as the fact that on all of these different deposit types, you're seeing several orders of magnitude uh, in terms of increasing concentration from background to um, proximal to mineralization. So how do we improve confidence? Well, certainly but the way forward with hydrogeochemistry and probably the future is um, it's the adoption of low temperature isotopic systems. And there's two ways to do this. One is as a vector to mineralization using um, delta copper 65 as a vector to uh, copper in groundwaters. 
the only case study of this at the minute is Pebble by Ryan Martha, and uh, he was, it shows very definitively that you can vector to the source of mineralization. A lot of people have used lead in groundwaters, uh, so Dicariat in uh, Broken Hill in Australia, Laybourne in Bathurst, there's a few other examples as well, where you can fingerprint the source of lead, whether it's from the country rocks or whether it's from an ore forming fluid. And thirdly, um, Delta Sulfur 34 as a trace of sulfite, uh, uh, sulfate sources. A lot of people have done this. Most recently, it's Clint Risman, et al. 2015. Uh, he did this in a suite of groundwaters from northern Chile, and he was able to differentiate between sulfate source from the oxidation of sulfides versus sulfate so uh, source from the dissolution of gypsum. And secondly, the characterization of water sources, using hydrogen and oxygen to model sources and mixing profiles, what our sources of solutes are, um, and how they control uh, the dispersion of elements. So in conclusion, hydrogeochemistry is an effective yet underutilized vectoring tool for undercover targets. It, in arid environments, there's often pre-existing water sources that can be used for sample sources, potentially removing the need for drilling at an early stage. Groundwater provides a mechanism for the vertical and horizontal mi uh, migration of elements, which we can sample. And low temperature isotopic fractionation occurs and can be used as a vector and tracer of mineralization. So I'd just like to thank my co-author, Simon Jones, who's in the room, as well as the exploration teams of First Quantum and CDLA Resources. Thank you. Thanks, James. We do have time for some questions now, if anyone has them. Could you please step up to the microphone so everyone can hear you? We don't well, have I've any. got a question for you, James. I'm afraid not. You'd have to go sample each ball. Um, yeah, but there's been a lot of advances recently in the, the analysis of groundwaters, and you've seen a lot of, of the detection limits lower. Uh, governments don't really analyze for uh, trace elements, really, in the same way that you would do, or, it, or, or for the same detection limits that you would do for these kind of programs. So you will very rarely find government data sets available on this kind of data. Yeah, definitely. It's one of the pathfinders for sure, yeah. As well as molybdenum. All the oxyanions are pretty good for, in particularly basic waters. And the cutoff at 100 meters that you said if it was, you know, if your overburden was more than 100 meters, forget it. Uh, how sensitive is that? I mean, obviously, as metal prices go up, you can push that deeper because that's just a, a matter of it's too costly to do it below that. Yeah, and you know, within that grid, there were areas uh, where the, there was 120 meters of cover. It wasn't a, a fixed cutoff. It was just more blocks, large blocks of more than 100 meters. Um, and it, it, it will come down to like, personal preference, I'd imagine, like, yeah. the, the kind of risk you're willing to take on. <laughs> Definitely, yeah, particularly in well, uh, in Africa, for example, in, in Zambia, you see uh, in the wet seasons, you'll see dilution effects. So for a lot of these kind of studies, and in particular Botswana here as well, we sampled both during the wet season and the dry season to see what variation occurred. So, but you do, you do see dilution effects during uh, particularly heavy uh, wet seasons. I think I saw you had some more. Go ahead. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation. Um, I was part of a team working in that area in the early 90s when Anglo-American was working there, and we, we, it was too difficult to set up an AA lab quickly in the field, so we actually, because we needed a quick turnaround of copper results in the soils using a reverse circulation rig in the sands, um, we actually set up an old, olden day style Zambian copper belt colorimetric lab to quickly get copper, which we were finding was coming up through quite a lot of sand. I can't remember what the depths were, but 20 to 40 meters. So my question is, did you use any um, surface low level copper conventional geochemistry to try and work in the shallower uh, sand cover areas? 
Um, we, we did trial it over, over areas of known uh, mineral occurrences. There was also a, a suite of government data sets which were available. Um, trialing soil geochemistry as, a, as an exploration tool in the area. And the results were largely inconclusive. So it was hard to um, dedicate a lot of resources to a program like that, where, uh, particularly where we knew the depth of cover and we were skeptical about whether we'd be even able to generate surface anomalies. So it was a combination of uh, not really being confident in the results that we'd seen at surface and some of the historical data that was available sort of pushed us away from uh, trialing that further. That's great. Please join me in thanking James once again.